Okay, well, good morning, everybody. So, uh, Stefan and I were faced with uh, the same impossible task that uh, Ralph and Michael were faced in earlier in the week, namely to select uh, a few winning posters from uh, a sea of some 350 posters. So, it seemed like an almost complete impossible task. Um, however, we decided to uh, apply a few criteria, namely, uh, we said, well, first of all, there need to be, of course, a good and solid and exciting result. Uh, secondly, effectiveness in getting the message across. Um, as you will see, and especially with the winner, that was uh, very strong on that particular poster, very clear sort of uh, goal of the, the project and then also the results. In 30 seconds, you could grasp what it was all about. That's also very important in, uh, in a good poster. And finally, we also uh, applied some artistic uh, aspects uh, and people that were very original in their projects. And it was actually amazing that when we started applying all of these three criteria independently and we walked through these uh, heated uh, rooms for one and a half days, uh, that we came actually uh, down to about a dozen posters uh, that uh, independently that, uh, that, we all, uh, that we both agreed on. Uh, some of them were very clearly in the artistic uh, part or, or the unusual part. I mean, I've seen, uh, of course, an iPad just posted on your poster board. That is another way yet of uh, presenting a poster. Maybe we'll go that way in the future. Uh, we don't know. But uh, uh, there are they're, they're very interesting new sort of uh, techniques being used, especially the QR codes for uh, uh, showing people the movies uh, that you cannot put on your poster. So I think we'll see quite a bit of development at, at, in the future. So in the end, we agreed on four honorable mentions and one winner. Um, I should say that we did not judge any of the posters that uh, either of us was involved in. So people from Geneva or Leiden or MPE, you should not be, feel disappointed if you're not mentioned, uh, because that's <laughs> simply we took you out of the competition. <laughs> So, uh, uh, so the winners are, in the, in, sorry, I should say the honorable mentions are, the first one is B016, that's Kluska et al. That is the first high angular imaging survey of Herbig AE stars with Pioneer on the VLTI. We saw there some beautiful first images and a fantastic instrumental achievement. So that's certainly worth an, an honorable mention. The second one is B050, Hashimoto et al. New scattering light images of transitional disks around the Tori star at the planet forming radii. So this is from the SEEDS imaging uh, project with some very interesting classifications uh, and radial profiles uh, that show differences between the different uh, sources. So that was also a, a fantastic uh, result. Uh, then K049 by Courtney Dressing. Uh, on inferring the rate of planet occurrence around Kepler stars, especially those in the habitable zones. There we were really impressed how she got a real number out uh, with error bars out of this, uh, uh, this huge data set and uh, uh, it's clearly a result that will have a lot of uh, impact. And finally, K082 by Beitz et al. Uh, the experiments on the consolidation of chondrites and the formation of dense rims around chondrules which is really a beautiful combination of laboratory experiments and also astrophysical applications all in one, doing the experiments jointly between Germany and, uh, and Japan, and then uh, also uh, getting, presenting the data then in a form that they can be used in astrophysical models, and then also doing the astrophysical applications. So that is also uh, one of uh, a very good uh, set of uh, laboratory astrophysics poses as this meeting. So now I hand over the floor to Stefan to announce the, the winner, but I think we should have a round of applause for the honorable mentions as well. Thank you, Ewin. Before announcing the winner, I have to say that I want to thank and congratulate all the people that did these wonderful posters. It was a big task to go through, as she mentioned, and. Uh, you know, in the heat of the afternoon and in the CO posters, you had the impression to get easier, easily drunk than on the terrace here having beer. But uh, that was quite interesting. And uh, I've been impressed by the artistic uh, side of uh, many of the posters and how they, they tried to get the message through in a, a very, very good way, making our work a bit easier, easier I have to say. So the winner, and uh, the first slide is on display, is Esther Bunsley. She graduated in, at ETH in Zurich. 
on the scattered light from a planet, many of solar systems in preparation of the SPHERE project. And then she moved to uh, Stewart Observatory in uh, Arizona, where she started to work on this uh, variability of brown dwarfs. And brown dwarfs are just in between planets and stars and have not been covered uh, that much during the, this uh, conference. So it makes a very natural and interesting link uh, between the two populations, allowing us to learn about exoplanet, looking at objects that are, have similar features and easier, are easier to observe. And uh, I have the pleasure, because Esther won this uh, poster kind of contest, to give her the present and very nice certificate from the Protostars and Planet 6 conference. And I'm pleased to leave her the stage to tell you about what's in her poster. Okay. Hi, so I wanted to thank Stefan and Devine for going through the posters and um, allowing me to give some publicity to brown dwarf atmospheres. I want to acknowledge my collaborators, in particular Daniel Apai, with whom I worked with in Arizona and where this work was done. And he was also the PI of the HST program that led to these results. So why should we care about brown dwarf atmospheres? Well, if you're interested in exoplanets, in particular in the direct imaging of a young giant planet, you'll find that brown dwarfs really span very similar temperature range between 2000 and down to 300 Kelvin. And that leads to very similar atmospheric properties. But we don't have the problem of a star in the way that is very bright, so we can actually take direct spectra of these. There were several posters featured in the conference, and I'm sorry if I missed any. So brown dwarf atmospheres are strongly influenced by the presence of condensate clouds. And these really shape uh, the spectra. And as the objects cool, they shape the spectral sequence that uh, goes from M dwarfs all the way through the L and T dwarfs down to the coldest Y dwarfs recently found by the Y satellite. And many groups uh, are working on models of this. And these models are now also being applied to exoplanets. What is really interesting that was found in the past few years is that these brown dwarfs actually show very complex cloud structures. And this was inferred um, in part by the discovery of photometric variability. Um, several brown dwarfs were found that vary by several percent. And that was um, interpreted as being um, pat a cloud patchiness that you can see the flux varying when these clouds rotate. So <clears throat> here's a basic picture of uh, brown dwarf atmospheres at different temperatures. So on the right, we have an L dwarf in the temperature range of, for example, of about 1400 Kelvin. And these um, atmospheres are dominated by um, silicate clouds that are high in the atmosphere and make these atmospheres look very dusty and red. Then as um, you look at cooler objects and you get to the T dwarfs, these silicate clouds actually um, drop deeper in the photosphere, and they don't shape the spectra as much anymore. But you may have other um, condensates appearing, such as, for example, sulfide clouds. And also, the gas phase chemistry changes from CO to CH4. And this transition from, uh, of the disappearance of the silicate clouds happens very quickly, around about 1,200 Kelvin, uh, only in a temperature range difference of about 1 to 200 Kelvin. And it's not really fully understood, and many models have been made to try to explain this. And one explanation, for example, is that there is a quick rain out of this, these clouds, or that, that you might be forming holes in the clouds, which could then explain also the patchiness and the variability that is seen. In a color magnitude diagram, this is um, what the brown dwarf sequence look li looks like. So um, here we have the, on the right the red br brown dwarfs. This, okay. um, these are the, the L dwarfs, which are quite red in J minus H color. And then as you get to these 1200 Kelvin, there starts to be a turnover. The J band brightens and the objects become a lot more blue, which is the disappearance of the silicates. And then as you get the mid -t to the mid T dwarfs, um, the, they stay fairly blue and are mostly clear or may have some remaining clouds. Our program was to uh, do a, a spectroscopic study of the uh, time resolved study of the variability with the Wide Field Camera 3 instrument on HST, which is a really a fantastic instrument. 
So we got time-resolved spectra for three of such brown dwarfs that were known to be variable already from the ground, two that are in the LT transition, so early T dwarfs plus one that is actually after the LT transition. And for that one, we also got simultaneous Spitzer data in addition to the HST. We followed these objects for several hours in order to, to uh, probe the whole rotation period of these objects, and we got really good time resolution. So first I want to speak about the T6, so that's this object here in the color magnitude diagram. You can see that it's a blue object, but it's actually on the sort of red side of all the blue objects, so there's actually some evidence for remaining clouds. So here are some results. On top you see the maximum and minimum spectra, so the maximum in red and the minimum in blue. Now you can't see a lot of difference here, because the variability is only on the level of 1 to 2 percent. But I assure you that actually the signal to noise of these spectra is so high that the errors are smaller than the lines um, here. So um, if you integrate the spectrum just to look at the time variability, this is what you get. So this is the HST uh, time series. We have gaps where HST is behind the Earth, so you can't actually measure the object at these times. But you can clearly see an evolution in the flux. And down here is the Spitzer data, which is, was taken in a partially overlapping mode. And Spitzer doesn't have this problem because it's not um, in an Earth orbit. So this is actually the first clear spectroscopic detection of variability in a brown dwarf. Um, if we uh, try to model the spectra, so first we started with the mean spectrum. Um, we found a pretty good fit with a model from Morley et al. 2012. So she was the first one to, uh, to include um, clouds like sulfide clouds in the models of T dwarfs instead of modeling them as clear atmospheres. And we got a pretty good fit to the spectrum, at least the mean spectrum, and she also po uh, postulated that you could get this cloud patchiness that could lead to variability. Now to study the variability at different wavelengths, we selected a few different wavelength bands. And I'm going to show you light curve in these bands now. So we selected the J and H band peak and a water and methane absorption band. So these are the light curves. And they are actually all fit very well by a sinusoid. This is a very fast rotator. The period is only about 1.4 hours. So by folding the time series, we could get really nice light curves covering the full rotation period. And we found amplitudes of variability that changed a bit by wavelength, about one and a half in the Spitzer band and up to 5% in the water band. But what was most interesting was that we actually found that the phase was different at different wavelengths. They weren't all in phase. In fact, you can see here, if you, for example, look at the valley here, you can see that um, as you go around here, it actually, the valley shifts. And this is something that we were a bit puzzled about first, so we started to see from the models what it is we actually probe in these atmospheres. And if you look at the pressure region that you probe, you actually find that this, the pressure makes the same. So from here, this is the deepest pressure in the atmosphere, so it's a fairly low layer. And as you go around here, you go to, in, um, to lower pressure, which means a higher layer in the atmosphere. So there seems to be some vertical structure that um, uh, makes the phase shift here correlate with the pressure that we probe. Now we don't really have good models to do that, to understand this yet, but we can at least um, speculate a little bit. So the first thing we think of always is patchy clouds. But actually, in this phenomenon, we find, find that patchy clouds are actually a rather unlikely expl explanation for the whole thing, because the highest variability is actually found up on the top layer. And if you had a lot of uh, patchy clouds there, that would influence all the layers below, and you would actually get in-phase variability and not out-of-phase. So you have to add some other mechanism. And one thing that uh, was proposed by Adam Schoeman was that you could have um, temperature fluctuations, which result from specific circulation patterns, which would then affect your um, flux at lower pressure. But so we would really need more uh, uh, comprehensive 3D models to really fit uh, this data. And we will actually get more HST and Spitzer data on this object soon. Now, briefly, on the other two objects, the, they are actually in the LT transition. Um, these um, objects, so they are early T dwarfs, and they still show signs of significant silicate clouds. They are much more uh, red still. So um, 
Here is, uh, for one of the two objects, uh, the spectra. So this is the maximum and minimum, and you can see this object varies a lot more. This the object actually has a variability of about 25% in J-band. So the, there are huge asymmetries in these atmospheres. And what is also here most surprising is that if you look at the ratio of the two, it is actually fairly flat with the exception of the water band here. The variability is almost the same in the J and the H, so the spectra just goes up and down. There's no real color change. And also, in spectral features like potassium, we don't actually see any changes. It changes in the same way as in the continuum. And that's not something you would actually expect if you have clouds and cloud holes where you see very deep in the atmosphere. If we look at the light curves of these objects, um, we don't see any phase shifts in the way as we saw for the T6 dwarf. In fact, they are all, so here's the JH and water, and they are all very much in phase. So this object has a little bit longer period, about eight hours, and this, the second one is also a pretty fast George Hader with about 2.4 hours. What's also interesting about this object is that over the course of only a few hours, we actually see an evolution already in the light curve. So there seems to be patchy clouds that also change um, rapidly in, in time. So in a sense, we're probing the weather in these atmospheres. If we look at their position in the color magnitude diagram, so this is, these are all the, the data points, and if we zoom in on this, we can see the color variation. It's, uh, as I said, there's really very little difference in J minus H color, which is somewhat surprising because the LT transition, what happens is that the objects actually get blue, um, and so this is the direction of the LT transition, and this is the direction of the variability, and they clearly don't match. So what we actually seem to have here is not the phenomenon of clearings in the thick, in the clouds, but what you actually need to explain this color change is a mixture of thin and thick clouds, but no clearings. So it seems that on short time scales, and the cloud structure se doesn't seem to match what happens on long time scales over this transition. So to summarize, and we performed the first unambiguous spectroscopic study of variability in brown dwarfs. We found very interesting phase shifts that correlate with the probed pressure, and they indicate quite a complex vertical and um, horizontal heterogeneities in a T6 dwarf, and you can find the uh, paper reference here. Then we find that the, in the LT transition, the variability does not actually follow the direction of the LT transition, which indicates thin and thick clouds rather than clearings. And again, here is the paper reference. So what's next? We actually have several HSD and Spitzer programs that are either ongoing or starting in the next cycle. And what we want to do is study the spectral variability um, as a function of spectral type, so at different um, places in the transition, as well as monitor this interesting time evolution of weather patterns that we found. And these observations are really needed to constrain the higher dimensional atmospheric models of brown dwarfs and later also extrasolar giant planets. Because really, even from the brown dwarfs, as more data as we get, we found that these atmospheres start to look more and more complex. So thank you. We have time for a couple of quick questions. Please go ahead. Uh, Wes Fraser, HIA. Um, congratulations, great stuff. Um, I'm curious in this, this T6 dwarf that you yes. first talked about, uh, if the variations you see could be due to uh, localized dredge up and, and weather reminiscent of Jupiter's red spot. And if not, how come? Yeah, I mean, it could be something like that. I don't think, so Jupiter's red spot, I don't think it would induce such a sort of a phase shift because it's pretty localized. But yeah, we like to make the analogy of this weather in brown dwarfs that we see. Also, because if you actually look at Jupiter at certain wavelength, Jupiter is actually quite variable itself by several percent, so. Yeah. More questions? Upstairs? Very good, let's thank our speaker again. Good job.